I came up with the term with other people. It wasn't me myself. There was a group of us in London in the mid 90s, late 90s, that wanted to put the emphasis on creativity in the wake of the increase in attention given to information and data. And we felt the, the human creativity was being missed. So we wanted to emphasize that. I've worked in the entertainment business all my life, so I've always been interested in creativity. And what we were trying to do with the creative economy was to bring together the common elements in all of the creative industries and to look at them from a business, cultural and economic point of view. That's a big question, and there are a number of different views about that. There is no standard definition. The UK has its own definition. The UK government has its own definition. I slightly disagree from that. Most definitions were generated before digital really took off in the late 90s and the early 2000s. So they didn't really take account of digital, and digital changed really everything. So there's the question, how much of it is to do with arts and culture? How much of it is to do with digital, which doesn't necessarily have anything to do with arts and culture? How much of it is to do with tech and innovation? And what's the boundary line between tech and creativity? And those are really interesting questions for governments who need to intervene. And when they intervene, they have to define things. If you're talking to a designer of furniture or clothing or a, uh, a, a tech designer who's doing an app or maybe intelligent clothing, is that creativity or innovation? That is not something they worry about. That's, that's not the frame of reference that they use. These are the wrong questions for the creative people. Very important for government, not interesting to the creative people. I wanted to emphasize the, the context, the human context, the emotional context, the, if you like, the sensual, tactile context, uh, and the aesthetic context. I wanted to identify what circumstances make people confident about being creative. And so I wanted to look at a creative situation, a workplace, a firm, an organization, um, a city neighborhood in very strict ecological terms. And I looked at change and diversity, learning and adaptation, those four factors. And those are the four factors that make up a creative ecology. Well, in China, they began to think seriously about this around the year 2004, 2005, 2006. And they are now fully committed to it at the government level. And the creativity in China is astonishing. It's, it's um, very widespread. It's, it's totally understood at every level of society that it's important. The, the, the talent in China is hugely impressive. And we're talking about talent on a, on a big scale. Um, the, the ambition is huge. The, they work really hard. They have supreme confidence that what they're doing is of relevance to them, to their society. And like all good creative people, they think that what they're doing will benefit society, not only in their own country, but the world. You know, all creative people think what they're doing will add positively to the world. It's, it's, a, it's a good instinct. It, creativity is always thought by the creator not to be neutral. They are creating something beautiful and, and, and beneficial. And that is a very important part of it. And the Chinese think that in, in, a, in a big way. Um, they have a different approach. They think much more about the, about the social implications of what they're doing than people in the West do. 
because they're not such an individualistic society. But they are hard workers, very talented and very ambitious. Well, every country has its own culture. Um, every country has its own history. Every country has its own aesthetic. Some are very visual cultures, some are more verbal cultures. Every country has its own language. And every country has its own place in the world. So those factors, and every country has its own education system. So those factors will be the prime factors in determining whether or not there is the passion and the ambition to be creative. So when I'm asked about, by a city or a country, how can we do it? I say, well, look, two things. You have your own culture, your own history, and what's happening here? What are you good at? What do you like to do? What do you really have passion to do and to do well? And then if you want to make a big business out of this or you want to uh, export, then look around the world and see what, what, what other people are doing. If your government wants to help, then look at how governments around the world intervene and help. And in every industry, craft, design, filmmaking, there are a very limited number of models. But there aren't an infinite number of models. There are a very limited number of models. In the film business, there are about three or four ways of doing it. This is, this is so easy. This is not difficult. Um, so look around and then take the ones that suit your particular circumstances. That thought process is quite difficult for many governments to go through. It's, it's very simple to go through, but governments don't like to often fully recognize their own culture. And they don't like to look around the world in a rather neutral way and say, well, that's it, that method works quite well there, but it's working well for particular reasons, but we can borrow bits of it in, in a very technocratic way suited to our own culture. So intellectually, it's quite an easy process to go through. In terms of the ideological ways in which governments think, it's often very difficult for them to do. Uh, very profound. Yes, I mean, the, uh, the British have had a undisturbed history of creativity across virtually every form and genre. Let's say since Shakespeare, since 1600, undisturbed, and highly educated population with a huge emphasis on culture and very inclusive from around the world. Very argumentative, uh, very passionate, uh, and very skillful. We've been very lucky. And we are part of the European Enlightenment, where individual talent and inquisitiveness and curiosity um, and quirkiness and idiosyncrasies and are given freedom. And we have very, very strong public institutions, part of the European Enlightenment, very strong public institutions. Uh, China has a much longer history of creativity, but it's been interrupted, let's say 1900, 1906, 1910, 1911. And they've had a difficult 20th century with a lot of civil unrest. And civil unrest is the killer of creativity. If you get a brutal government or you get civil unrest, it kills creativity. And no question, it's the worst possible thing you can have. In England, we've been very stable. We've been very lucky. Most countries are not so lucky. China was unlucky in the last century. It now had a, and then it had a communist uh, government. And that communist government did not value individual creativity. 1980, things changed again, suddenly, radically. And it's still a, it's still a, a Marxist-Leninist government. Uh, very strong communist principles but they allow individual creativity. But the individual creativity is always being checked against what the creative person thinks is good for society. 
So very profound differences, each of them um, wonderfully producing astonishing works. I wanted to emphasize this, and this is basic factual data uh, drawn on uh, psychology, uh, neurology, neuro studies, studies of the brain, uh, early child development, that children, uh, young children, infants, from the moment they are born, as their brain forms, and it takes some months and years to be fully formed with all its parts working together, what's called the executive function of the brain, get into the habit of, of dreaming, um, get into the habit of comparing their dreams with what they gradually realize is reality, get into the habit of comparing yesterday's reality with today's reality, trying to make themselves comfortable to start with, that's water and food and excretion. That's all it's physical, very physical. It begins to be a little bit emotional. And they start to choose their dreams, if you like. It's a dream to be more directed in their dreams. They love to play. They love, play is really serious for them. But they can then stop immediately. But then they can go back into it and the rules are very serious. And they hate the rules being broken. They love dressing up in weird costumes and playing and performing and acting. They love drawing, they love color, and they're not embarrassed if, if, if someone thinks, because they never think this, that it's good or bad. Not a question. They just want to explore their creativity, explore their aesthetic and explore their performance and and just acting and, and performing. And they love, uh, they have invisible friends. They invent invisible friends who are often more real than their real friends. And they become very attached to objects and tell stories about objects. Um, so, and that peaks at age three or four. So every child that is born into a safe household, two qualifications, safe household and is normal is very creative. If the household is not safe um, and they have some physical or mental abnormality, then they're not. But absent of those two, then they will be very creative. I'm going to make a distinction between two sorts of entrepreneurs. I'm going to make the distinction, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the traditional entrepreneur who, who forms a company, runs a company, hires employees, builds up a company. Those people are rare and they always have been rare. They're slightly more common now, but they're still a tiny, tiny minority. And when we talk about entrepreneurs, we should be clear, we're not really meaning those people. I mean, you need those people. They're critically important for the development of any economy, whether it's manufacturing or, or creative economy. They are quite ruthless, very single-minded, often very difficult to get on with. Um, they like to start up something, and once they've started up, often they find it hard to manage it when it's mature, and they often start up something else. Um, and then there's the entrepreneur in the sense of somebody who takes charge of their own ideas. And that could be an independent person, a freelance person, who works on contract to other people. It could be someone who sets up a little company. or but they usually, The companies usually stay quite small. So. There's a difference between the traditional entrepreneur and the independent creative person. And there's often confusion because we use the same word for both. And government policies aimed at the entrepreneur are often misguided 
because they, the government people don't quite know the difference. And they, they have programs to support small businesses, which is the traditional entrepreneur. And they think that's fine. And they try and apply those, that thinking to the other sort of entrepreneur. And that can often lead to misunderstandings and problems. I think you have to wait for them to come to you. I, I, you can open the door, but whether or not the people walk in, I mean, you can do all sorts of things to help them come in, whether it's you know, a nice room and nice coffee, and like here, uh, and, and a welcome, and, and you could be welcoming, and particularly welcoming to people who might, for reasons of ethnicity or gender, or family home situation or education might feel excluded from the creative industries. So you can enhance inclusiveness. And we do that a lot in the UK. Very important to us, enhancing inclusiveness and enhancing diversity. Very, very important. And there's an issue here, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a very live issue here about gender and disparities between men and women. And that plays out in all sorts of interesting ways and, and the ways in which people are beginning to use gender as part of their identity. Um, and then there's the issue of men not treating women as they should be treated. And that, those, those are two big issues. And, and, um, every country should make sure that it um, behaves well and, and is, is, is inclusive uh, and that's really important. Um, so there are some things that you can do but it really is up to the individual to think the door is open and why don't I just walk in or why don't I do something that makes a noise, makes a noise and then people won't notice me. I use the word creative economy, not creative industries, because to me that emphasizes the, the making, the producing, the selling, and the buying. Again, governments are focusing mainly on the supply side, because that's what they can do. They cannot influence the buying, the retail, the buying, except in one big way. So I emphasize both. I emphasize the whole economic chain. The, the way that governments can influence buying is through their own procurement. When, when government buys something, whether it's commissioning an architect, commissioning a designer, whatever way, they buy lots of services and they should make sure that they respect, that, that they know about, respect and use as much as they can local suppliers. That's really important. The government here, at, 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 the, at the Filipino level, at the, at, the, at the city level, has huge powers of patronage. And that's very important. But generally, governments can't afford, can't, can't influence retail. So it's very important that if you are interested in the creative economy, you go out and buy stuff. This is why education is important because people who have been to college and university not only want to work in the creative industries, but also they have the mindset, probably, to make their homes beautiful, to make their offices beautiful, and to, to spend money on their, on their clothes, which might lead to buying something which is creative. Um, so that's, uh, that's what I call the creative economy. It's looking at the whole, the whole value chain. How do I know whether a company is sufficiently creative? Um, well, I, have my, I would have my own job in the businesses I know about, which is the entertainment, the film, television, video, uh, streaming. I would sort of make a judgment. If I'm a director of the company, I'd make a judgment. Of, are we doing well enough? Could we do better? Is that person there? Because I, I know it means only a man here. Okay, is that person there? 
really pulling their weight? Are they really contributing to us, to, to the venture? Are they really, and that, but that's a personal judgment, and if not, why not? And is it because no one likes them, or they don't like anybody else, or the ideas are no good, or the, their boss is not looking after them, or maybe they're having fantastic ideas, but the boss isn't allowing them to come through. So there are all sorts of sort of organizational management and, and personal judgment issues on, on, on whether something is clear or not. And, and then there's another level, you know, is there stuff selling in the marketplace? I might not like it, but it might work in the marketplace, and that's okay. I don't have to like everything. This, this question of judging creativity is always composed of those two elements. Is, is the person doing something really wonderful in their own terms, as wonderful as they can make it? And then, does it work in the marketplace? And the first is not enough, and the second is not enough. You need, as a, as a manager, you need to make sure both are happening together and, and sort of feeding together and encouraging each other. I feel I can apply it to any, any country, any, any, any economy, any society. I, I can absolutely. Uh, applied here, and I and I am applying it here because I'm working with AIM, so and Paolo Mercado at the Creative Economy Council. So we are applying it here. Um, th there's a sudden upsurge of interest, I think, in the creative economy in the last three or four years here in the Philippines, which is fantastic. Um, you haven't had the ambition until maybe I don't know the, in the last ten years or so. You've had individual successes but you haven't had a, a sort of mass movement yet. And, and what we're looking for is a, is a mass movement where everybody, from the highest levels of government to, to city level, neighborhood level, everybody is thinking, yes, we can do this. The meaning of creativity for, for me is, is uh, having, using an idea to have a new idea. So it's, it's continually looking at what's around me and saying this could be different and better. And, and that's an that's a endless process. It, it's not fixed in any place or time. It's an endless cognitive, emotional process. And sometimes it just you know, goes along in a small way and some, sometimes it peaks. So that's the process of creativity that I think everybody here has this. You know, I think that's what we do. That's why we're here. Um, the creative economy is when I think, in a more focused way, that this particular idea is relevant to that particular project and would help that project become more interesting. So I'm currently developing a TV series and it's being it's in the hands of the producer at the moment and we're casting it and budgeting it at the moment and it's being done by other people but occasionally I think well actually that would be it would be slightly better if, if it was done that way so every so often I parachute in and I say have we thought about this have we tried would this be better so there's the endless 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 exhausting and wonderful creativity and then there's the uh, input into a creative product with a with a with a commercial outcome.